They are God's spiritual army, supernatural creatures of immense power, light, and wisdom, angels. Their name comes from the Greek word angelos, meaning messengers. We find them throughout the scriptures, from the staying of Abraham's hand, just as he is about to sacrifice his son Isaac, to the announcement of the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary about the birth of Jesus. While we've all heard stories about the miraculous working of angels, what do we really know about them? How many exist and are there different kinds? How have angels communicated with people from the past and how do they continue to affect the lives of everyday New Yorkers? We'll explore these questions and more as we examine Angels of the Burrows. Join us as we unlock the mysteries of the church. image of angels is of cuddly cheeked babies with wings. The angels we find in the Bible are far different. They are creatures of immense power who can literally move the heavens and the earth if so permitted by God. To learn more about what the Bible reveals about angels, we spoke with Professor Karina Hogan, a biblical scholar of Fordham University. So as a biblical scholar, somebody who has studied angels, why do you think we are so fascinated by these creatures? I think that what fascinates people about angels is that there's something other than human and other than God, right? So we, according to the Bible, human beings are created in the image of God, and yet we recognize ourselves as being so very different. We have this need, I think, for something to be sort of in between. Um, so angels are these, you know, immortal, spiritual beings, and yet they're not. God, they're individuals like us. So I think that people sometimes find it easier to relate to a being that's a little less than fully divine, um, like a guardian angel, for example, than actually confronting God in God's awesomeness. So what are the different functions that angels play in the Old Testament? Like comfort, protection, warning, where do we find these different roles? Sure, yeah, angels play a lot of different functions in the Old Testament. Some of them are purely just messengers there to deliver a message. More often, there's some element of, of helping as well. So for example, um, Abraham's other wife, Hagar, when she's running away from Abraham and Sarah and she's in the desert, an angel comes and delivers a message to her that she's going to have a child, Ishmael, but then at the same time also saves her, or saves her and her son, Ishmael in a later chapter. So there's a lot of angels that have sort of double functions. For example, in the story of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac, it's an angel that steps in at the last moment to stop Abraham from killing his son and points out that there's, a, there's an animal caught there that he can sacrifice in Isaac's place. So angels have sort of a dual function of messenger and often helper or rescuer. Why do you think, as a, as a historian, somebody who works at the cemetery, why are there so many angels at cemeteries? What's the connection? I think for us, for folks that see angels, it's just this situation that there's hope, and they're pretty, and we want to know that some beautiful creature is going to take us up to the afterlife. So it gives us a sense of that there's hope and that there's more beyond life here on Earth. Angels do two things. They represent that we're a cultured community, that New Yorkers copied what they saw in Italy and what they saw in England and France on the Grand Tour. We wanted to show that we had taste, so we put angels in the cemetery. Traditionally, though, angels are a symbol of the resurrection. It lets us know that we're going to heaven, so it brought a lot of comfort. You would come visit the cemetery and you'd say, there's the angel that's taking us up to heaven. And so it would bring comfort to the children, comfort to the other family members, and besides, they're beautiful. You'll see many angels with trumpets as they're calling you up to heaven. Some have books because they're writing down your name as you enter into heaven. Some will have flowers. You'll see lilies as the symbol of purity. Of course, there's faith, hope, and charity. 
where oftentimes anchors are symbols of hope, crosses, of course, are symbols of faith. So many of them have things in their hands that tell you a little bit more of a story about them. To learn more about how angels impact our spiritual life, we're here at Princeton University to speak with Father Marty Miller of the Aquinas Institute. Well, an angel is a spirit, not material. We are body and spirit ourselves at once, but an angel a power, more powerful than ourselves, very simple, very in tune. We say that angels can, can know and see God in a way that we can't. Um, and it's great power as angels are sent by God with a mission, their mission to help us. While they're not seen by us, and we can know their help in our lives. But we're left as free beings. We're not forced by these greater powers angels or demons. The angels are our, our guardians. They're without need to sleep. They're there constantly looking after our good, being that simple way without matter that they don't need rest as we do. They're always on guard. And so in our, in our, during our life, in our times of difficulty, whether we're that awake or not, they're awake. And surely also our Lord in His time and near the end of his earthly passage here, our Lord there in the agony of the garden had an angel sent to comfort him. And so in that time of sorrow and heavy weight, the angel was there. So in a, in a way in the cemetery where, the, where we, we leave the remains of our beloved to rest and have our prayers there, we can say that the guardian angel still has a kind of a vigilance over them. And it's a, a sense of when our sorrow is left there with our Lord, our angel is there was there to console. While created good, the church teaches that at the dawn of time, a large number of angels rebelled against God. They were led by Lucifer, known as the light bearer, the most powerful angel of all. He and his rebel band of angels chose eternal darkness rather than humble service. To learn more about the relationship between human beings and the spirit world, we spoke with Dr. Richard Gallagher, professor of clinical psychiatry at the New York Medical College. Many theologians speculate that even prior to the creation of the universe, there were countless angels, and some of them rebelled against God, and uh, you might say they went to their own place. They separated from God, and that's what we sometimes call hell. And they, they do seem to have a hostility towards creation, hostility towards uh, the Trinity, Therefore, they, they seem to get some perverse satisfaction out of attempting to influence people towards evil. A lot about this we don't really know, but from scriptural references, and especially from our Lord's references, we do know that there was some kind of rebellion, you might say, in heaven, and uh, that a certain percentage of the angels, probably not a trivial amount at least, rebelled and separated themselves from, from God, presumably led by Satan. Well, in Catholic theology, there, there are different speculations about why this happened. It seems like these rebellious angels were acting out of a sense of pride. And then there's a lot of theological speculation as well that somehow they could not tolerate the humanity of our Lord. And that there was some kind of reluctance, presumably out of pride, to submit to God's will in general, including in that area. Coming up next on Mysteries of the Church, we will delve deeper into how angels communicate with human beings and see what happens when a fallen angel attempts to take over a person's soul. Stay tuned. Angels, the messengers of God. While the Bible is full of stories of the intervention of angels into human affairs, how is this interaction possible? Do angels communicate by taking human form, or do they speak to us internally through inspiration or intuition?
angels often act very, very discreetly. They seem to have several particular missions. They do try to guide and enlighten us. Uh, they may warn us uh, in very dramatic situations, although I think these are very rare. They may literally rescue us from something. Although their job is often, I think, very, very discreet, almost private. You almost don't know whether they're helping you or not. I had a very dear friend who was not a, a agnostic, but she wasn't really very much, very mystical, shall we say. Um, but she had great devotion to the angels. I asked her why. Once her little boy wouldn't go to bed, and she told him he had to go to bed, and she sent him upstairs. And shortly thereafter, he came running down the stairs and said, an angel came into my room and told me to come downstairs. And she said, well, your mother says go back upstairs. And as she was saying that, lightning struck not only the house, but struck his bed. For just as there are uh, demons, the devil himself, striving to have us fail in our love for God, for his victory. Uh, our angel is there to preserve the true victory, which is our coming back to our Lord, to finishing our life's journey well. Day to day, we need to take this into account. Know very much that we are tempted, that temptation is always at our elbow. We have a guard angel at our wrist there to guide us more closely and to help us to win in our battles. Well, when someone is attacked by a fallen angel, uh... The first thing you have to do is discern whether the person is not psychotic or dissociative or something like that, if this isn't primarily or exclusively a mental illness. Some aspects or some typical features of demonic attacks go so far beyond mental illness that it's fairly, it's fairly, it becomes fairly obvious that you're dealing with something in the preternatural realm beyond a natural illness. Some, some more typical things are people will actually become physically attacked, physically attacked, like beat up, scratched, etc., by demonic forces. In more dramatic cases, uh, where the demon totally takes over the, the person and the personality, uh, that's where we generally think about a possible possession. In those cases, you'll often see the person go into a kind of a trance, and you'll see the clear display of a foreign intelligence, often very, very hostile to the to religion, to the sacred, to the church. And since you're dealing in that case with a foreign intelligence, you'll often see signs like the ability of the demon to reveal hidden knowledge, or the demon may speak in different languages. And, and I've seen both of those manifestations many times. Uh, in very rare situations, uh, you may even see something like a levitation. Normally speaking, during an exorcism, the individual, who again is in a trance, they will often fight to escape, so they often have to be held down. And that's sort of another classic criteria of a um, genuine possession, uh, that in addition to hidden knowledge, in addition to speaking a foreign language, they can often uh, exhibit an enormous amount of strength. They may never uh, have met this person before, but they may know um, how somebody, how a relative died. I mean, I had a woman uh, who was possessed talk to me about, you know, my mother dying of ovarian cancer. So the effort to get rid of that is not really a magical effort. It's not some kind of ritual magic and incantations. The overall process is to have the person return to our Lord and turn to our Lord. So exorcism is sometimes misunderstood as some kind of magic ceremony to drive out the demon. Exorcisms are sacramentals. They, 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 they are often very powerful prayers. 
and they're united with the prayers of the church. Ultimately, though, it's our Lord who decides sort of when the time for deliverance is, is correct. When we really deal with actual angels, we're gonna understand that they're part of our battle for sanctity, our battle for doing well, loving God more. And so they're going to be there helping us to open our eyes, helping us to see how we could struggle better, aiding us in our battle. And so there's going to be some struggle here. The angel is another powerful reminder that while we're in the presence of God always, we're yet not alone for another reason, that God has another one who loves us, given us to take care of us especially. And that often I think modern man suffers from a great loneliness and a great um, worry that is there anything out there? And there is one out there who loves us. This is our Lord God and another who he has sent us to be particularly our help. And that's our guardian angel, one in whom we can trust and open our heart to and ask for guidance and know that help will be there through that angel that God has given us to know his love in a secondary way through that, that being that loves us. Up next, we'll speak with some New Yorkers who have had real life encounters with angels. Stay tuned for more mysteries of the church. Well, we have to remember when we talk about the angels, we're talking about very vague territory, at least from this side of knowledge. Angels belong to eternity. And so when you're outside time and space, when you're pure spirit, very hard to find adequate language even to begin to describe uh, uh, what they are. In the material order, these very, very strange things exist. So how much more in, beyond time and space? That's why when we try to explain what pure spirits are, we use rather symbolic language. Uh, St. Augustine and St. Gregory the Great, Pope Gregory the Great, both stress the fact that these terms represent functions, not essence. Uh, so I can ask, you know, who, who's Joe? Well, Joe's a carpenter, that's what he is. But I, I, I'm not describing who Joe himself is. We can because he's a human and we're human. But when it comes to angels, we, we, it's very difficult to even conceive of what it is to be outside time and space. So. We can only talk about what they do. And there's a hierarchy in the sending order of them, and we have what are called nine choirs. And we call them choirs because the job of the, these pure spirits are, uh, is to praise God. And the best way to praise is to sing, not to speak. Uh, angels are the lowest of them. Uh, the word angel, angelus, Latin, angelus, uh, uh, Greek means a uh, messenger, a nuncio, an ambassador from God, someone who interprets God to us. And they're the lowest because they are involved in this world of time and space. The higher you go, the more you get removed from this world. And then we have the archangels, which have particular power. There are only three named in the scriptures. Uh, Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel. Michael is the warrior, the defender. Raphael, the healer. Gabriel, the messenger. It's Gabriel who tells Our Lady that she will bear the, the Messiah. Angels, uh, uh, the archangels, and then uh, virtues. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, again, it's a, it's a sign of, uh, of strength. Uh, dominations uh, or, or powers and then princely uh, powers, uh, dominations, thrones, cherubim, and then the very highest, uh, the seraphim. It is said that when St. Francis of Assisi received the stigmata, he could see the seraphim. And the seraphim are the closest to God, but he was given that privilege.
ancient traditions, both Jewish and Christian, tell us of these spirits without bodies, these extraordinary creatures that we call angels who also intercede for us. We know in our own tradition that it was Gabriel who brought to Mary the extraordinary news that she had been selected to bear the Christ child, to bring the incarnate one into the world. That same angel appeared to Joseph after she became uh, pregnant, and Joseph was very fearful because of the cultures and mores of the time. Fear not, Joseph. Take Mary as your wife. So angels play a very, very important part. Uh, we are uh, told from the time we are children that uh, we have assigned to us a guardian angel. I suspect mine has resigned probably 10 or 15 times, okay? And uh, I will find out how many there were when I get over onto the other side. But these are spirits who pray for us, who guide us, who help us to choose the right and avoid the wrong. And this is the angel guard that when the moment comes for us to pass from this life to the next, accompany us into the divine presence. The great words of Therese of Lisieux, I am not dying, I am coming to life. So we need to have a devotion to the angels because their prayers help us in our journey, protect us from evil, and then they are that vanguard, if you will, that can lead us into the, the mansions of eternity. Angels, in a world that often feels cold and indifferent, how comforting to know that we have an entire army of invisible friends working on our behalf. Pope Francis, in a recent address, encouraged Catholics to become more aware of the invisible presence of angels. He reminded us that each of us is given a guardian angel that not only walks with us through life, but will stand beside us as we enter into the everlasting joys of heaven. Thanks for joining us, and tune in next time as we unlock more Mysteries of the Church.